Hi, and welcome to How to Decarbonize Your Organization at Fashion Declares. Thank you so much for joining us. So today we're delighted to have an expert panel that will be talking about uh, how they've decarbonized their organizations uh, from, from different perspectives. And I, and I think that you're going to find uh, lots and lots of inspiration, lots of tips, lots of ideas, um, even for those of you who have, have really started uh, the journey within your organizations. What I'd like to do now is to start, um, this series of webinars has been brought to you by Fashion Declares, and, and that's because we know that best practice needs to be share, shared in the fashion industry. Fashion Declares, as you know, is a, is a bottom-up international movement that uh, helps to, to educate um, and to campaign for a more regenerative uh, um, fashion system. So the speakers that are joining me today, we have uh, Nisant Chopra from Oshadi in India, uh, Alicia Thieu from uh, Green Element, and then Debbie Luffman, who's uh, one of the original founders of the Fashion Declares movement from Think Circular, formerly Finister, and then Beba Greer from Reformation, and Anthony Burns, sorry, Tony Burns, um, from the amazing ACS clothing near Glasgow. Um, the, the global fashion industry is responsible for over 2 billion tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions. That's uh, according to, to, to different stats, between uh, two to 4% um, of global greenhouse gas emissions. That's according to um, McKinsey's survey of 2018. There are other surveys that uh, suggest that it could be as high as 10% of, of uh, total greenhouse gas emissions. And the shocking truth is that on the current trajectory, that's likely to grow to as much as 25% of the total of greenhouse gas emissions if we continue on the same trajectory. So what's clear is we need to cut greenhouse gas emissions. We need to cut, cut CO2 uh, from every sector. Um, and um, and we, we know that we're also looking at uh, our, our personal carbon footprints. So if you're in the UK, it's approximately 11 tonnes of, of carbon. And you know, to get to a global average, we have to reduce that personal um, footprint to, to just over uh, two tonnes of carbon per person um, as, as, as global citizens. But today what we're gonna do is we're gonna shape and frame uh, how we decarbonize the fashion industry. And I'd very much like to, uh, to welcome uh, Nisant Chopra. Uh, at the moment, he's joined us from, from India, but I was lucky enough to have a quick chat with him last week and he showed me around his farm. Um, and I wonder if we could um, pull the slide deck up Oh, so sorry, there, there, I just wanted to summarise for you first the questions that um, we were hearing um, as we were promoting uh, this, this webinar. So some of the questions were, you know, what is scope one, two and three? And, and where are fashion's carbon emissions mostly produced? Uh, we also were, were being asked, you know, how do we decarbonise our buying? It can uh, fibre farming and the way that we choose the fibres and the materials that we use in fashion make a difference. We were being asked also, how do we, um, how do we switch from uh, coal and fossil fuel based production and manufacture uh, to, to renewables? We were, we were being asked, how do we start to measure our carbon footprint and how do we make a plan? And um, and also what are science-based targets and is there something for the apparel and footwear industry? We were, we were being asked how can a fashion business change or, 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 or transition its model, its business model to incorporate resale, rental and repair uh, as, as an initiative to reduce carbon. Um, and also can, can better buying um, reduce the carbon emissions, can carbon offsetting uh, make uh, a significant difference? Can it actually save the planet? So these are some of the questions and we are going to be um, talking um, to, to many speakers uh, to find out from their perspective uh, how, how we can move forward. So just to give a bit of a global context, so we have had, uh, as we know, we've had uh, the, the, the various climate conferences, we've had um, Kyoto, we've had Paris and we've had Glasgow last year, but we're still uh, on this incredibly dangerous 
trajectory um, heading for, for, for two degrees or more, um, the, the COP26 keeping 1.5 alive um, is, is now being, being really questioned as, as, a, as a nonsense um, because we are, we are heading for much, much higher levels of, um, of, uh, of global heating. And that's also largely in part uh, of the, the banks that have, have, uh, have actually um, supported and, and invested in fossil fuel industry expansion um, by over three trillion dollars just since the uh, the Paris Agreement, and and we can see that um, the, this increase uh, to uh, four hundred parts per million has has actually uh, generated extreme uh, weather conditions. Is increasingly uh, creating um, uninhabitable land. It's um, pushing into uh, question ecosystems and, and that ecosystem and biodiversity uh, collapse is also impacting food security worldwide. So, um, you know, we, we look at uh, 20 years out where as much as half of the population may well have to move um, because they're, they're unable to support themselves in terms of their, their livelihoods uh, and, uh, and food and water systems. So this this you know, creates a, a huge uh, a huge un unimaginable um, scenario one that looks even worse than um, you know the 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 awfulness of of the, of the Ukraine and and um, and the uh, the impact of of the war that we're we're seeing. If we could move to the next slide, so um, the, the climate emergency, um, the ecological and the social emergency is also. All, all the more unfair um, because those that really uh, are responsible for the the um, the uh, for uh, for global warming for global heating are in fact those of us in the global north um, and the global south actually that is responsible for only eight percent of it uh, is really bearing the brunt um, of of the extreme weather conditions and the struggle that is being faced now um, by the climate collapse. If we move to the next slide, so we know that the UK government has been asked to prepare for a 4% global temperature rise, um, which we, we know is, is catastrophic. So we know that business uh, and citizens really are absolutely key to pushing for uh, government regulation and government action uh, and climate action. Um, so that we can avert the worst um, of, of the disasters that, that are being predicted by, uh, by the scientists and by the IPCC. So um, this is a slide that my colleague Ben um, often uses. We don't have a, a right to ask whether we are going to succeed or not. We, the only question we have a right to ask is what's the right thing to do? What does the earth require of us? And if, if we want to continue to live on it, and this is Wendy Berry, uh, the writer and environmental activist. So I'd like to share with you uh, my, my very brief visit. Nassant so, so kindly showed me around his farm last week. Um, this is something that I, I just took um, uh, using my phone. Nassant uh, was just walking around uh, his organic farm in uh, southern India. Carbon sequestration uh, report, like because we do like a test of organic carbon, NPK, and organic matter before, and we redo that after nine to eleven months once we finish like a complete cycle. But this is uh, the cotton which we've harvested today, uh, yesterday. Sorry, so it goes into drying like today, today. Uh, but this is our record for this month last 15 days so we have like a record of each farmer it's like you know uh this soil was like hard rock like before we started like we this is one of our first farms like it's three years now working on this and it was a hard rock now it's kind of becoming porous uh because it's like low till but also like there's no hot chemicals like only thing that goes in is like compost which is also like a bit porous but uh yeah it, these are like wormy beds we are making new wormy beds the old ones, like if you see all the composters out from the old ones, so we just need to like pack it, but these are empty again. So we are going to fill like all these compost beds with like a fresh manure. 
and it goes back into the vermi bed so basically like all all the cows are tie like you know the graze free graze in the farm like the mango farm behind uh our cotton farm so this is about 10 acres and about 40 40 cows graze here but in the evening we tie the cows in this shed so basically if you see in the shed uh there's like a way of getting like cow urine and cow dung like see if you see there's like a small canal inside the inside a compost thing and it goes like so it goes into this hole and it comes out like there's a filtering in between and like it comes out in this tank and so this, this and this thinking. and this is gold dust right this um all of this cow dung and cow urine this is what's helping the soil and helping yeah, exactly. the plants That's, right yeah yeah so everything we make cow dust like cow urine and this is like the main source it's called panchagavya like one of the things we are making now here's like uh, castor here's like uh, ulundu i don't know what's it called it's probably called black gram in english uh there's uh, sanape which is like sunhem uh a lot of cover crops intercrops companion crops this is cotton uh if you see it's just starting to <laughs> So I can Looks see kind of like a butterfly. I can also see drip irrigation uh pipes, yeah. Yeah, drip irrigation because uh it just saves like 50 60% of the water uh and it's so easy to do farming with drip irrigation. I wanted to start with um that tiny little clip. I'm sorry it was so rough and ready, but it was a, just a fantastic quick visit. I think nature-based solutions are uh so important. This is about carbon drawdown and if we do regenerative agriculture, uh we we have a, a huge opportunity to um to really uh, build healthy soils and and resilience uh and to and to sequester carbon. So I I'd, I'd like to hand over now to Nishant um Could we uh could we bring the sense presentation up please? Thanks. Uh, thank you for having me. Thanks for having me Sophia. Um thank you. Uh, to introduce myself thank also thanks for showing uh the short clip of our farm for uh to introduce our work uh uh actually started as a contemporary women's wear brand and you know out of curiosity to find um the solutions like how do we weave in a better way with less energy how do we dye in a better way how do we so like we went towards like every step of the supply chain and we someone wanted to restore the ancient indian farming and textile systems and we didn't really know a lot about carbon sequestration at that point of time i was only thinking about what if the simple systems of farming and textiles were restored but like as we moved in we started realizing it was called regenerative farming and we learned about carbon sequestration and we realized like we were sequestering like carbon for example like uh what well, like one acre of each of our farms like we tested before and after and it sequestered like five metric tons of carbon i don't really know like if all these soil tests like you know are kind of i'd be lying if i said like i completely believed in them because if you take a grain of soil in one hand and you go like 100 meters ahead and you take another so grain of soil and then you test it the, t- the results are so different but like you know visually i know like a lot of it is like intuitional but a lot of change like you can see through like water infiltration ecosystem restoration are the birds coming back are the bees coming back how porous is the soil how how much can you retain like the water uh when you give in how much water are you saving you know what kind of diversity of crops you have and you know like it's it's like kind of mimicking nature so you know uh, i realized like you know you just have to go to forest just observe what's going on you come back and it's called like agroforestry you do agriculture mimicking the forest and that's what we were trying to do a lot of information was lost uh because like it's all old people were practicing it but we learned from so many different old like communities and you know we took all the goods and, like you know bits and pieces trial error and then you know we ended up creating a seed to source supply chain it actually didn't start from the farming side it actually started from the brand side and then i was like how do we weave okay then how do we dye how do we spin how do we so you we came back reverse and we ended up in farming because like you know we thought like the entire system was you know not going in the right way um and we just wanted to make our own system and then like what happened was we ended up like sharing the system with like brands who believed in same things as we did because it's really important for us to work as a community to bring about a bigger change and it's not about us like you know it's sort of of course like you know when i started like i really wanted the brand to be like the most beautiful brand the best things but then you're like 
if you share these things with other brands, it's like a collective of things. I think like we have this one mindedness, individuality, like when we do things, when we do business, it's good, like in creative ways, but it's really, you have like, you know, when you work as a collective, because we all, we are like, you know, are part of the same place. Like, you know, we can't think as individuals, like, you know, when we, when it works towards nature or against nature. So, you know, like we started, of course, like if you see regenerative practices, it's not, it's not just about like, agriculture you know it's about your mindset like how do you treat others how do you see a farmer how do you see someone how do you interact with nature how do you interact with like plants how do you interact with cotton how do you interact it's like all about interaction and like interaction in a very like in a way where it's reciprocity not extraction you know when we go in it's not like extraction but like you know it's an exchange you know like we come into this world as an exchange and that's exactly what regenerative practice is it's pretty simple like you know it's, it's like it sounds like a space technology because a lot of people are like you know they're not educated in this way but it's like the most simplest thing you could ever see like you know you just go into the forest observe what's going on diversity like you know companionship like working together like the community like you know dependent on each other and you just like bring it back and you apply it to the basic nature of laws like and you know that your work and that's exactly what we are doing i'm not a well-read man not well, not a well-read boy like i'm not i don't know but anyway like um you know it just comes through like observing what's around you and then learning from interactions with people with different communities different culture and you know you let you become less ignorant and you know you bring back all those practices and you kind of like you know it you know one thing like you know it's a gandhi or i don't even know who said that but it's like it's treating others how you treat yourself and treating others can be anyone it can be you it can be the plant it can be a small bee it can be like a tiny earthworm everyone's playing a role like you know your housekeeper is playing a role your seamstress is playing a role you know if your seamstress wasn't sewing like you wouldn't be able to sell your garments at 250 dollars um if your housekeeping is not keeping it clean you'd get the garments which are stained you know and also like coming back um the rural economy concept of our work came from this ancient textile systems where everything was in a rural india the spinners weavers all of the people were based within like in a small community and we brought back all our supply chain within 100 kilometers so like ginning spinning farming weaving all of that stuff happened in 100 kilometers if you ask me tell me numbers i'm not good with numbers i can't tell you but i'm pretty sure it's much better than supply chain like which goes around 5000 kilometers like 1000 kilometers to istanbul and it comes back to india and then it goes to portugal and then it goes to us like you know, our stuff is just like done within this hundred kilometers and it just goes straight to the clients. A lot of times, like, yeah, I think that is like, I don't even know numbers, like, you know, like how much we've saved, like carbon. I'm pretty sure we are way ahead, like in terms of other supply chains we look at in terms of like low carbon emissions, sequestering ca carbon, regenerative farming practices. I mean, we are at the start of everything. If you ask me what our impact is, like, you know, I wouldn't be able to let you know what the impact is because like we've just started like three years ago and the destruction we've done as human beings is for like last couple hundred years, like green revolution, all that stuff. If you ask me if you've like had a big impact, no, like we, we've not had big impact. But if you ask me, are you starting somewhere? Yes, like we are starting somewhere. And I think that's the most important thing, starting somewhere. Like, you know, everyone's got to play their roles and like, every individual role like yours mine as a consumer as a buyer as a brand like everything matters like and i think that's one thing like and you know um i think i want to finish this thing with you know just start somewhere and every every thought every individual matters like you know that makes a community thank you you've you've done amazing work and i i i love that um that the um the organic cotton that you're producing will be um you know it will be sequestering maybe as much as a ton per acre, maybe more you were discussing with me. The other five metric tons, because we put in a lot of organic matter, like, you know, we put like at least like five tons of organic matter in per acre, but like, like, no, like not definite. Like you take a grain of soil from one corner of the field, another corner of the field, I'm just like so mind boggled, like what's going on, like, <laughs> what be? but that's what soil is. And then, of course, hand, hand weaving. I mean, if you do a calculation rather than using, you know, oil and, and a power loom, if you use, uh, you know, yeah, hand, hand weaving, hand, hand power, that's that's going to be, yeah. you know, that's a that's a ton of carbon for for every every hand loom. Um, I know we calculated. Exactly. 
and we make natural dyeing and also spinning all our spinning is like renewable energy so all the spinners we work with they you completely rely on solar energy to spin that but you know i think it's a start a long way to go for all of us yeah well th- thank you so much for for sharing sharing your journey i know that you might have to um to leave us halfway through but i hope you'll you'll stay on for the next um half an hour I'm, really, I'm sorry like a lot of background noise ask. Thank you I'm so sorry. much, Nathan. Thanks. I, I'd um, thank you. I'd I'd love to ask uh, Alicia Thieu from uh, from Green Element to to help us with some of the kind of the the basics so in terms of the 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 beginnings of really understanding what scope one, two, and three is, and 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 how a fashion company might start um, to 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 work to to map out and to measure. Uh, their carbon emissions and and to to set a plan to to start reducing them. Um, over to you, if I can, Alicia. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much, Sophia, um, and thanks also, Nathan. That that was such an interesting um, interesting talk. Um, brilliant. So um, I'm Alicia. I'm climate analysis manager at Green Element, um, and we're an env- environmental consulting firm. Um, so we've worked with lots of different. Co- companies across lots of different industries to measure their carbon footprints so sort of tying in some of the the numbers that sort of Nissan's alluded to in his in his presentation and um, so recently we've started working with the fashion industry and um, Debbie who's also going to be speaking today um, will be describing our work with Finisterra a bit later um, but for now I'm going to be taking you through some of the initial steps in measuring a baseline carbon footprint and setting science-based targets and starting to think about how you can decarbonize the supply chain. Uh, next slide, please. So um, starting with very sort of basic building blocks, a carbon footprint is measured in tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and emissions are converted into a carbon dioxide equivalent, which is a single unit that expresses the carbon footprint as a single number of all the greenhouse gases combined. A carbon footprint is categorized into three um, scopes under the greenhouse gas protocol. So scope one considers all direct emissions, such as gas use on site heating or vehicle fuel used in your fleet. Scope two accounts for indirect emissions from the generation of purchased electricity, heat or steam. And scope three accounts for all other indirect emissions that occur in the value chain. Next slide, please. Um, so how do you get started with measuring your baseline carbon footprint? Well, the first step is to consider your own operations. Um, what do you use that could fall into your scope one and scope two carbon emissions? For a fashion company, this um, might look like scope one and two, the energy use in offices, warehouses or shops, um, as well as the vehicle fuel used in delivery vehicles. It's also important to keep track of the fuel mix used to generate the electricity on your tariff. For example, is it 100% renewable? Um, so next slide, please. Uh, scope three can be a bit more complicated because this incorporates your whole supply chain um, and there are 15 different scope three categories, greenhouse gas emissions. So the first step would be to map out your supply chain and identify suppliers to send surveys out to. Um, and there's an example here um, um, of sort of surveys that we've sent out before to manufacturers. Some key areas to consider for a fashion company um, could be to look at raw materials and processing, garment manufacturing, um, transport and distribution, packaging, your digital footprint, so especially for e-commerce, um, online orders and things like that, um, waste and water. And it's really important to consider the environmental footprint um, of, of clothing and, and footwear throughout its lifetime, so from cradle to grave, to ensure that the impact of its use and disposal are also accounted for. Next slide, please. Um, So once you have collected your data and calculated your baseline carbon footprint, you're then able to start thinking about setting science-based targets. Science-based targets will put your company on a trajectory to meet science-based net zero by 2050 and align with 1.5 degrees global warming. Science-based targets are robust, they're meaningful, and they're in line with the climate science. And the benefits of setting science-based targets can include resilience, um, regulation, improved credibility. They can be positive for um, companies' reputation, offer opportunities to innovate, um, improve cost-effectiveness, as well as future-proofing your business. So thinking about the steps, so first you would set your near-term targets, which are five to 10 years emissions reduction targets. Second, you would set long-term targets, which will result in emissions reductions of 95% of scope one and scope two by 2050 and 90% of scope three. The next step would be to take action to reduce emissions in your value chain to achieve these targets, which we will have a little look at later. 
Finally, you'll neutralize your residual emissions via permanent carbon removal and storage. Residual emissions are the last 10% of emissions which are left when you achieve your long-term target. Next slide, please. So the Science Waste Target Initiative publishes specific guidance for some sectors, um, and it does say for the apparel and footwear industry. So according to them, there are two main ways that fashion companies can reduce carbon emissions in line with the science. The first is to aggressively deploy energy efficiency and renewable energy across the value chain. And the second is to substitute materials with a lower environmental impact. So next, we're going to have them um, have, um, sort of explore about what this means. Next slide, please. Um, so there are sort of different levels of influence associated with the actions that can be taken to decarbonize the supply chain. Um, and the place where you have the most influence is, is going to be within your own operations. We've sort of got some, some examples here, and, um, which I'll, I'll sort of just go through a few of them and the rest will be shared later. So actions to decarbonise um, your own operations could include focusing on lower carbon, recycled or organic textiles, um, which sort of ties into what, what we talked about with Nissan. Um, however, it's worth being aware that some sustainably um, branded textiles can have a higher impact compared to their conventional counterparts, depending on how they're sourced. And so it really is important to refer back to the science um, when making those decisions. Freight is another key activity for decarbonisation, both in terms of the mode. So, for example, rail and sea um, freight are less carbon intense than air freight, as well as the fuel type. So um, thinking about working with hauliers and couriers who are using or integrating electric vehicles or investing in hydrogen fuel technology um, as part of their fleet. Within your own supply chain, there tends to be slightly lower influence. However, here, collaboration with suppliers is absolutely key. Can you incentivize and reward suppliers to eliminate the use of fossil fuels or transition to more efficient processes and machinery? Can you also support raw materials producers to move away from harmful pest, pesticides and fertilizers and take up regenerative farming practices instead? It is really important to ensure that changes made to the supply chain also consider the social impact of making that change. And finally, the place you have the least influence but should also be considered as consumer behaviour. Um, however, trialling garment rental repair and recycling schemes can empower consumers to use clothing in a more sustainable way. Um, and sustainable care can be promoted via labelling website and also at the point of sale. Next slide, please. Um, so something we get asked quite a lot about is carbon offsetting. Um, so we just sort of wanted to touch on that here briefly. So um, once you've reduced by 90% um, sort of along the science-based targets trajectory, the science-based targets initiative permits the residual 10% of baseline emissions to be removed by permanent carbon removals. Um, I mean, so if we know that carbon, oh, sorry, <laughs> should I wrap up there? Yes, I think so. Okay, sure. Um, well, anyway, just to say that um, there's some more information about carbon offsetting and carbon removals options um, at the end. And Lucia, thank you so much. I'm sorry to, to speed you up there at the end. Um, we will be no we will be sharing the, the presentation later, so you'll you'll have um, Lucia's full slide deck. Um, Thirty months uh, is is all that we have left. This is a, a Guardian article of uh, of Monday. Um, the, 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 that is how quickly uh, global greenhouse gas emissions uh, must, uh, must, must fall by. So this is a conclusion by the world scientists collated by the, um, the IPCC. So, you know, we, what we're talking about, even though we're talking about, you know, how do we cut um, beyond 2030, 30 months, three years, um, is is really all, all, all we have. Um, so I'd, I'd like to ask Debbie now to, to present, uh, to take us on, on the journey. I know you work very closely with green elements. So hopefully some of the elements that, some of the parts that Alicia didn't cover, you could cover in, in your presentation if you wouldn't mind. Thanks so much, Debbie. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, very much part two. Um, so yep, yeah, thank you for having me again. Uh, for those of you that have been at previous Fashion Declares events will know um, I'm Debbie Luffman. I run the Think Circular. Um, it's a change agency supporting businesses transition to a more regenerative and circular fashion system. Um, up until the end of last year, however, my main job, um, my proper job at the time, was product director at Finisterre. Um, so today I'm going to put my Finisterre beanie back on to share with, with you all our 
uh, carbon footprint project, um, which is very much part two of the green element um, some intro there from Alicia. Um, next slide, please. Before I dive into our journey, though, I'm sharing this slide because it very much sums up how I felt at the back end of 2019 pre pandemic, when I was sort of self-imposed project to map out Finisterre's carbon footprint um, you know a very very noisy space so here's just a very few e examples that I was seeing in in the media particularly from brands at the time you've got carbon negative climate positive climate neutral net zero real zero true zero you know a very noisy space um, and I knew what I wanted to achieve for Finisterre at the time but I felt very confused by all of these messages that was really being bombarded um, in, in my face so I think sort of tip number one for me is to try and cut out the brand noise try not to get your information from from the brands themselves um, but to really sort of understand the science and to understand we get into those IPCC reports there's some brilliant data that you can harness um, so with that as the background, um, I was very fortunate at Finisterre because we are, Finisterre is a, a B Corp, we had a ready-made audience, really, a community to go out and ask for help. So that's exactly what I did. Um, so I went out to the community and said, help, we're trying to map our carbon footprint. Who, who is good in this, in this space? Um, so I met an awful lot of carbon accountants, different apps I was presented, um, and then eventually we met um, a Green Element who you've just heard from um, from Alicia. So I explained, OK, I know, you know, we're a fashion business. We've got a very complex supply chain, but we need to understand our full impact across all of our business operations. Can you help us? I think they thought we were a little bit crazy um, because it is quite an undertaking, but they understood and agreed um, that it was vital that we looked at the whole supply chain. So we enlisted Green Elements help. Um, and uh, this is what we went on to do. If you could do the next slide, that'd be great. Yeah, so that is basically a schematic of everything that we measured. So we're talking about our direct emissions, to use Alicia's language there, um, the scope one emissions, so that's our direct emissions from our office, our warehouse and stores in the UK, as well as the scope two, the energy that we, we're purchasing as a, as a business. Um, and then we went on to look at the transportation, both to and from our warehouse in the UK, um, and most crucially, our scope three, so our supply chain, uh, predominantly looking at a value chain, we're talking about 24 factories across eight different countries. So, you know, quite a lot, lot, a lot of work to do. How did we go about doing this? So we're talking about bills. You're looking at anything you pay for. You've got quantities against. So looking at, at bills from energy suppliers and waste um, a very, I have to say, it's not very sexy. We're talking about a lot of Excel sheets uh, to drive this, um, sending out templates predominantly to our supply chain. Big shout out here to Finisterre's um, positive impact manager, Adele, who did the lion's share of this work. A lot of chasing suppliers and a lot of support from our suppliers to give us this information. Once we got the data back, it was a case of really funneling it to green elements to then for them to then go ahead and calculate Finisterre's baseline carbon footprint for 2020. Um, for the benefit of time, if we move on to the results page, that would be great. So what did we learn? So here is the sort of the key um, hotspots, as it, as it were, of the carbon footprint for Finisterre for 2020. And I think, you know, uh, we were surprised to a degree um, at the extent that the supply chain came in here. So actually, if you look at the combination of materials, manufacturing and transports um, from the supply chain, it's as much as 80 percent of Finisterre's carbon footprint, which is typical, I should say, of, of, of a, a fashion brand it's just, you know, across the board. And quite shocking that a lot of brands are not reporting their scope three emissions. You know, they're only looking at such a small proportion of, of the stuff they can change. Um, so to some degree, surprising, you know, at the same time, not surprising that it, you know, there was such a, a, a huge proportion came from the supply chain. But 68% was materials, huge. So a real opportunity for us to dive into our material mix. Um, also, just a small mention on transport distribution, it's actually quite a small figure, I think I was quite surprised, so only 10% of the total carbon footprint was 10% 10, 10 
um, was transport and distribution. And actually nearly half of that was from customer returns. So really small, but we had done a lot of work in terms of uh, uh, road and rail and sea shipping. We weren't airing any products. So, you know, some, some good news within the mix as well. Um, I will move on to the next slide in terms of actually how that then, what do we do with that data? Yeah, so that's great. We've got some, some quite sort of big picture information about where the hotspots and key impacts of the Finisterre uh, carbon footprint across its entire business operations. But what do you do with that practically on the floor? So in order to make this really tangible and practical, we worked again with Green Element on um, a full life cycle assessment of the top three um, or one of our, our sort of, uh, key uh, volume products across the range. We're talking about a 100% organic cotton t-shirt, a 100% wool roll neck jumper, and 100% recycled polyester uh, jacket. And what was really interesting there is getting an insight into where the hotspots, where the key carbon impacts are. And actually the surprising thing was the Harlan tea, the, the cotton t-shirt, organic cotton tea, was actually the lowest carbon impact across the three. But what was interesting is actually the consumer um, impact there. So actually 50% of its entire footprint was based on the amount you have to wash it quite a lot. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a basic tea, you wear it an awful lot. Um, the farm roll neck was a much higher carbon footprint, um, but actually that was mainly because of quite intensive, carbon intensive materials and its input. But over its lifespan, it's going to be washed a lot less. It's made of wool and, and it's a classic garment. You will keep that going, going forever. Um, and then lastly, the Nimbus jacket, this was its highest um, impact was from manufacturing. It's more of a technical garment, there are more components and it's made further afield. What was really interesting to us given these sort of these, these three products, these insights that it gave us was actually, what can we do? What are the levers then to make, you know, we've already made some really good progress on materials. How can we make it even better? What are our tools, not only at a product level, but also at a customer level. So resale, repair, washing less, all of those, you know, the sort of the broad holistic 360 of a product. Um, but my last comment, because I can hear the gong, um, is that we can only do that through collaboration. So actually there's only so much that Finisterre can do as a brand, but it's really about pulling together with the value chain, supporting one another to make those overall big picture um, exponential impacts. Um, that's it from me. Thank you. Debbie, thank you so much. Really, really practical steps uh, and just the, the, the acknowledgement there that uh, Scope 3 low, uh, materials, for example, and, um, uh, and, and combined with transfer, just how big they are, but also the, the LCA in terms of uh, how customers use clothing. Incredibly powerful and brilliant presentation. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on now to uh, Beba Greer from Reformation. Thank you so much for joining us first thing in the morning from Los Angeles. Uh, if I could... Um, ask you, Beba, to present. Thank you. Yes, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Beba Greer and I'm the Sustainable Operations and Innovation Manager at Reformation. Um, and for those of you who may not be familiar with REF, we are a lifestyle brand that combines stylish vintage inspired designs with sustainable practices. And we're committed to minimizing our environmental impact um, and achieving fair, safe, and healthy working conditions throughout our supply chain. Uh, next slide, please. And to Debbie's point, um, this is a really, really crowded space as far as commitments go. And we have um, an ambitious goal to be climate positive by 2025. And there isn't an agreed upon guidance or definition of, of what that means yet. So we are defining this as meeting our science-based reduction targets and then removing more emissions than we produce. So I wanna stress that this is our own defined goal and our emphasis is first to operationally reduce our impacts as much as possible. And again, within um, the scientific boundaries to limit global warming by 1.5 degrees Celsius, and then to invest in carbon removal projects, ideally within our own supply shed. Uh, next slide, please. And um, in order to do this, or to, in order to reach our goals, um, again, like Alicia and um, Debbie mentioned, we needed to first take a look at what is our carbon footprint. And we're using 2021 as our baseline. And, and these are our figures that um, will measure our reduction targets against. 
And as you can see, our footprint follows a, a very similar pattern that most companies um, will see in, in their own footprints is that the majority share of our emissions falls within scope three. Ours is, you know, 98%, which is, you know, a, a huge bulk of everything. Um, and from here, we then looked at, you know, what are our hotspots? And we built a roadmap um, to, in order to reach our climate positive goals and found that our work will really fall within four key impact areas. So next slide, please. So our first is better materials. Um, similar to Finisterre, almost two thirds of REF's total carbon footprint comes from our material sourcing. So our cashmere, leather, silk, and viscose have big carbon footprints and we grade every fiber we use. We're, we're taking into account the water input, energy input, land use, ecotoxicity, greenhouse gas emissions, human toxicity, availability price, so so many things. And then we rank and measure each fabric within our own fiber standards. And we're always working to use more innovative, sustainable fibers. Um, but we also know that it can be super difficult to name, you know, what is the most sustainable fiber because of how many different variables we're measuring. And, you know, sometimes the alternatives we're really excited about aren't always 100% commercially available yet, or they may have quality or other trade-offs. Um, so we'll have to take a longer term view for some of these changes when it comes to sourcing. However, there are some things we can do right away, like eliminating silk and um, conventional cashmere in the next year to really sh shrink our sourcing footprint. Um, next slide, please. So next is circular practices. You know, these are a great way for um, reducing emissions because they eliminate waste, they help regenerate natural systems and keep materials in use. And they, again, there's actually um, not a really clear standard to quantify carbon reductions associated with circular practices such as reuse, repair and recycling, but um, we're not gonna let that get in the way of a good thing because we know that circular practices contribute to lower demand for materials and thus lower carbon emissions. So we recently relaunched our REF recycling program to give customers options to rewear, resell, and now recycle their clothing. Next slide, please. So for us, um, transportation is really huge. So it, it takes a lot of fuel to transport our raw materials to our factories and even more to ship um, our finished goods to our warehouse retailers and customers. And we predominantly use air shipping, which allows us to be super nimble and reactive to the market. Um, also benefits our customers who have those speedy delivery expectations. Um, however, it should be no surprise that shipping via air is 30 times more carbon intensive than shipping via cargo ship. Um, so if we crunch the numbers, we can see that if we do no other um, decarbonization interventions, we need to get to at least a 70% ocean, 30% air split to really reduce our, our footprint. Um, but this will impact our, our production planning, our inventory management, um, and our delivery times in a really big way. So we're putting together an internal cross-functional team to determine how we can balance the business needs for flexibility, quality, and sustainability all at the same time. Uh, next slide, please. So finally is energy management. So um, our scope one and two, as you saw, is relatively small compared to our more energy intensive stuff in scope three, like our, our mills, our dye houses and yarn producers. Um, and part of this is due to the fact that we've already implemented many energy saving projects. Um, and we also purchase renewable energy credits that um, offset the electricity within our operations um, for all of our retail stores and our, our own factory as well. Um, so next we'll be working really closely with our supply chain partners to help map renewable energy opportunities. And we'll also educate our customers along the way because um, again, as Debbie mentioned, how they wash and care for their garments can also be really energy intensive um, due to hot water cycles or even dry cleaning. Um, and finally, last slide. Um, just wanted to say again, you know, this really does take a, a collaborative effort. Um, we worked with an outside consultant called South Pole to help us at least just map our reductions. And I feel incredibly lucky. I'm, I'm one of six people in our sustainability team at Reformation. I know many of you who are on this call who may be in um, the sustainability field work off of really lean and mean teams. So we put together a, a business to business guide on our website um, 
to help others who may not have the same resources. And, and I'm always here and available to share lessons learned or answer any questions. Um, and with that, thank you for your time and I'll, I'll pass it on to the next uh, speaker. Thank you so much, Beba. Um, I, I, I'm seeing a, a huge number of questions coming up and I realize that we're running quite late. Um, I would just like to point out that on June the 8th, um, we have a low impact materials, regenerative farming and biodiversity webinar. So please do register for that because we'll be going much more deeply into low impact materials. Um, and um, that there are some speakers here that will also be talking, we dig digging much deeper into that area. Um, so thank, thank you very much for your interest in that. Um, I'd like to invite Tony now to run through the ACS model in Glasgow and, uh, and tell us how we have all been actually, uh, without our knowledge, um, working together with you, you in the background. Thank you, Sophia. Um, so I'm Tony Burns, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at ACS Clothing. And uh, who is ACS or who are ACS? So we are the, we enable circular fashion. We facilitate circular business models of clothing rental, clothing resale, clothing repair, models which are inherently sustainable, but models which um, it's incumbent on us to deliver them in a sustainable way because that's what will accelerate the adoption of these models by our partners, the brands and retailers we work with. And these models, they are not only more sustainable than linear business models, but they are also more profitable. So next slide, please. So here's some of the brands and uh, retailers we work with. Uh, traditionally, it's been men's formal wear in terms of rentals. So we support uh, business like Moss Bros, um, Slater's Men's Wear, uh, lots of independents across the UK with uh, men's formal wear um, for black tie events and weddings. Um, next as well, uh, over recent years, we've started to uh, act as a third party logistics company for lots of dress rental companies like My Wardrobe HQ and Higher Street. And we also support um, baby clothing rental companies like Bun Lee um, and subscription rental in the UK like LK Bennett. Um, and rental in the UK is very much behind the US and Asia. Uh, because we have a culture of ownership in the UK predicated in the fact many of us own our own homes, but it is changing. We also support um, brands like Nudie Jeans with Repair, and uh, we uh, work with companies uh, with e-com returns, cleaning and repairing them, like ASOS, Hobbs and Whistles. And another area in the circular, uh, circular business models that is growing rapidly is resale. So we uh, support brands like Reflaunt, with uh, the resale um, for designer fashion. Next slide, please. So in terms of our mission, this is all uh, about sustainability, to be honest, uh, because it underpins everything we are doing. So we are talking, we have had multiple conversations with the United Nations, with politicians at Westminster and Holyrood about the removal of VAT from rental clothing. We know that fast fashion brands, some of them don't take care of the environment don't take care of the people working in the supply chain. We do that, but we're competing with them. So we're looking for the removal of VAT from sustainable uh, fashion. We're, we're keen to become a recognized circular business. We think we have uh, achieved that in some ways. We've been invited to join the Ellen MacArthur Foundation as an emerging innovator. We do the basics as a good corporate citizen, i.e. nothing on our site goes to landfill. We're trying to reduce our carbon emissions to zero. We're targeting net zero by 2023. I'll touch on that in the next couple of slides. Uh, we have transitioned already to renewable energy and uh, we use um, ozone technology. We introduced that about eight years ago uh, as a means to sanitize items and clean them um, without using energy or very low energy, without using water and chemicals. And it takes care of the garments over time. And it also breaks down the, the barriers in terms of the biggest um, um, area where consumers are slow to adopt rental and secondhand fashion is a perception that these clothes are dirty uh, or full of germs and that's um, not the case and we use ozone technology to to dispel those sort of uh, thoughts. We're, we're keen that uh, sustainability also has a social agenda so we take care of our staff on site with lots of training and development, with CSR projects working with our uh, local communities and we've set up a biodiversity bubble around ACS with beehives on site, we have a green wall, um, a wormery for the food waste, 
Um, so uh, we are very conscious that we don't want to be a big tin can uh, warehouse facility. We want to protect the biodiversity of our local area. And uh, undoubtedly, we want to be the social and accountable benchmark for Scotland. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of this actual panel event, um, we use a Climate Partner as a um, company to an organisation to externally and independently verify our uh, carbon emissions. Um, we do not want to be accused of greenwashing, um, so uh, this really helps. Um, we generated pre-COVID in our baseline year of 2019, 1,200 tonnes of CO2, and it's split between about 20% scope one, 16% scope two, 64% scope three. Uh, we offset against all of that, including scope three, and scope three includes our uh, me driving to work today, includes all our partners uh, delivering parcels on our behalf. And we know some of those partners are also carbon neutral. So there's double offsetting going on against this. So it is uh, it's carbon negative in some ways. Um, and um, we also, when we look at the different types of uh, emissions, heating is a big part of it. Our consumables and packaging is a part of it as well. Consumables encompass the poly in our garments, labels, picking labels, dispatch labels. And um, what are we doing to mitigate this? So we're looking at different types of um, energy, maybe um, start uh, having a project with biofuels. We've already installed solar panels on the roof of our building. We have transitioned to renewables. Um, we have changed all the lights on site from halogens to smart LEDs. We've looked at reusable and uh, implemented reusable shipping bags. Um, we're looking at alternatives for our cleaning products. Uh, we've introduced bike to work schemes. We've got several schemes. We're promoting remote working where possible, um, promoting car sharing, and we've installed eight electrical vehicle charging points. And in the next slide, uh, it just gives you a breakdown of those tons. So we have dug right into this and we're trying to work on every single area. I'll stop there because I know we're a bit tight for time. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, really amazing work that, you, that you're doing. Um, and it's really exciting to know that a, a business like yours, which is promoting circularity and, and really giving li uh, longer lives to the clothes that are already uh, produced is, is something that we can do um, way, way, way better. Um, so thank you so much for that incredible presentation. That we've had some really super interesting questions um, in the chat box. Um, I'm aware that uh, there is a, a question around the cost of um, doing uh, both the the, the carbon um, benchmark assessments uh, and um, creating those reports in the initial stages, and also uh, creating the life cycle analysis. And I'm I'm wondering, um, Debbie, if you might. Um, pick that up with maybe approximations of the kinds of costs. I mean, I appreciate that obviously you know, every every company is is different. Um, would that be something that you'd be prepared to answer? Yeah, sure. I mean, I went in those initial moments. I was looking for the right person. I was quoted anything from I don't know four thousand pounds up to sixty thousand pounds. I think this it depends. You know, it's one of those things. You've got to find the right partner. You've got to explain what you need, what your 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 requirements are. But the only other thing I would say as well is, you know, what what's the cost? You know, I think I was told of, of so many things during my 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 career that business critical that have to, you know, they are so required and they've got to, we've got to invest in this for the future. What what more is there to invest in um, than our future, right? So I think there's a really good case for making the investment, but just be reasonable. Find somebody, you know, who who gets you and say, can I pay in installments? You know, whatever. Like it's um, be human. <laughs> it's not that expensive. Is my short answer. <laughs> Well, th thank you. Thanks so much for the reassurance. Um, so I mean, interesting that, you know, what we're doing is we're looking at so many different components uh, to be able to, to really cut emissions. So looking at how we transition away from fossil fuel, uh, synthetic fibres towards uh, low impact materials. And, and yes, they could be um, uh, regenerative agriculture. They could also be some circular economy. Um, fabrics and fibres. So we, we, we'll be going into that in much more depth on June the 8th. So please, please register for that event now. It's on Eventbrite. Um, also, there's a really important intersection here with, um, with the transition to net zero 
and to adjust transition because as we start to pull um, or to reduce carbon emissions, um, we, we have to do that mindful that the, some will argue 60 million, others will argue 80 million workers that are within our supply chain. How do we do that in such a way that we can still provide meaningful, dignified work to those people in supply chains? And we're gonna be digging into that topic on May the 4th in our social justice and equality webinar. So, um, and, and Nissanth, and also uh, with our Shadi, but also with, with People Tree, uh, using, for example, uh, crafts, um, hand weaving, hand embroidery, hand knitting, all of these um, social impact um, craft techniques actually can generate huge amounts of livelihood. So, as we reduce, if you like, to buying uh, maybe two or three new items a year and the rest, um, you know, secondhand, uh, resale, rental, we repair. Um, you know, though that value addition, um, you know, how can we make that value addition as low carbon as possible? Um, we, we do have um, a, a, a number of other questions. I think Millie has put into the chat box, science-based targets, there is an apparel and uh, footwear um, specific uh, report and paper. So um, that's in the chat box. So please uh, have a look at that. that that's uh, quite a useful um, piece. What, what we really want to do is to is, is for you to be able to take away from this, you know, these are starting points. Um, as, as Debbie said, uh, you know, it's we're, we're looking now at, at the beginnings of legislation coming in at the moment. The global uh, price of, of carbon is about three dollars. I know the IMF and the OECD are calling for that to be increased to something like $75, maybe $150. So when carbon starts to become really, really expensive, all of those inputs become expensive. So actually you being the first to move to cut your carbon, to move away from fossil fuels, actually uh, can keep you competitive going forward. It can mean the future of your business, the future of the planet. Um, so I just wanted to ask Millie if you wouldn't mind to put the last um, couple of slides up. Um, so uh, we've we've brought this webinar. Um, thanks very much to the the lovely speakers that have that have helped today in sharing their their expertise and learnings on their journeys. Um, Nissanth, uh, Alicia, um, Emma, Debbie, um, Beba, and then Tony. Um, thank you very much for for joining us. Uh, please sign up if you've not already become a signatory to uh, the Open Letter at Fashion Declares and the five commitments of which this topic is, is one, um, to decarbonize as quickly as possible by, two, 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 by 2030 um, or as soon after as possible. Do follow us on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and do share the assets. Um, if we could have the next slide. And we've also launched Patreon, uh, which you'll find on, on Twitter and Instagram. Again, please sign up and join us uh, on, on one of these tiers and stay close to us as a community. You know, we are about being brave. We are about being ambitious. We, there are initiatives that are out there. This is the only bottom-up, industry-wide, welcoming all of the, the fashion actors. So we'd love to keep you uh, involved in the Fashion Declares movement. So, um, Last but not, not least, um, thank you all so very, very much for joining um, and to our speakers, if we could take the slide down so that we could uh, maybe just one comment, please, from, from each speaker, if you wouldn't mind. Could I start with um, Nisanth, please? I'm not sure if he's still here. Um, can you hear me okay? Oh, fantastic. Just a quick comment, please, if you wouldn't mind. I think I finished my talk uh, with the last comment and it should be like the first comment or whatever it is, like start somewhere. And, you know, just think individual, like just stop thinking individuals and more community and, you know, the solutions there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Alicia, can I ask you for a comment? Yeah, sure. Um, so I suppose I would say just don't be afraid to get your hands on the real data. Um, just sort of get stuck in, collect it. And there are people like us and, and lots of other companies who can help you to work out what to do with it. It's so reassuring to know that you're there, Alicia. Thank you. Um, can I ask um, Beba for a quick comment? 
Yeah, thank you um, so much for having me. And this has been really energizing to hear everyone speak. I think um, a lot of these topics can be you know, really heavy and it's just lovely to feel the support of everyone interested and in, in wanting to do better and, and we need to do it all together. We're all one. So thank you. Thanks for joining us from LA. Tony, over to you. Uh, yes, um, we all need to go further and faster, um, but it is a journey of continuous improvement. It doesn't happen overnight. So we all need to start somewhere. So um, don't delay. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, we can't, can we? Uh, Debbie, T over to you. Yeah, just building on everything else that everyone's already said, um, just don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't pretend you've got it all worked out. Nobody had. Um, we're all needed. Uh, join hands around this thing together. Um, and yeah, cha change and, and positive change is possible. But yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Great to see you all. Thank you so much. Please sign up and um, do sign Fashion Declares. Join as a signatory and, uh, and join the community so that we can stay in touch. Thank you all so very much for, for joining us today. And thank you to the brilliant speakers. Thank you. Thank you.